Okay, record to this computer. Okay, we're good. Hey, welcome everybody. Yeah, I just got back. Uh, I was just in Portland. I just got back an hour ago from Portland myself. I was doing a lecture to the second year OHSU PA students about lifestyle medicine. So I've done that a couple other times over Zoom, but uh, I got invited up to the campus to do it in person now. So, so that was that was a lot of fun. But lots of questions, lots of good discussion with, with the young young ones on that, the next generation of PAs that are coming through. Did you get any pushback from any of them, uh, like maybe in the past, or was this uh, uh, a more welcoming environment? Oh, it was good. It was, you know, it's all academic. So it was, I just, I told my personal story and all that. And then, uh, and then dove into the, the same slides I do for lifestyle medicine with the, the six pillars and all that. But I talked, I talked, I added a lot of other stuff, but I, the only thing I, and I kind of left it open for them to discuss nutritional myths. I had plenty of time, so I, we talked a little bit about nutritional myths and all that, and, and they were wondering, yeah, what about the protein and this and that? So we talked about some of that stuff, so I think that was good. I'm trying to keep them away because it was right after lunch. It was from 1.30 to 3 o'clock, so I uh, did, did that with them, and it was, it was good. 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 Was anybody, is there anybody new here tonight? I'm looking through the names here. Like I see mostly familiar names here. If there's anybody that's new that wants to chime in and let us know how you found out about the classes and. Is Mary new? Um, and Rob? Yeah, Rob looks like a new one. Just kind of curious how you found out about the classes. Who might have referred you? Yes, Rob. Yeah, I have a, a friend who told me about the class and we watched it together once. So I'm joining on my own this week. So. Welcome. Glad to have you. Anybody else? Tonight's topic is going to be cancer, part, part one of two, which is a bit of a heavy topic, but I hope uh, if you read my email Sunday morning, the goal is to have you feel empowered when you walk away, not, not to feel despair, but to learn that, hey, we have a little more control over whether we get or get cancer or whether cancer progresses or not. So hopefully you'll, you'll feel, feel good, positive after tonight. Anyone have anything to share? Successes, challenges, questions, anything before we jump in? Hi, it's Dolly. Hey, Dolly. Um, I just wanted to share that I just gotten a new book over at Barnes and Nobles. It's called The Homemade Vegan Pantry. Um, it's basically making your own ingredients for everything out of what you have. There's no, it's mixing it up, but out of all of the vegan products that you might have. So if you wanted, you know, making meals and all that, but you store them in your pantry. And it's an awfully good book. It's by Miyoko Shinner. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's real. How to make your own um, margarine or butter or whatever it is. It's all vegan and it's just wonderful. Oh, great. Thanks for sharing. And it's also just a reminder of uh, this coming Saturday is the, the next, the second Eugene Plant Based Providers Community Walk. So that's coming up 11 o'clock in the morning this coming Saturday there at uh, the Valley River parking lot, kind of at the the west end of the parking lot, right where the the the, the bike bridge is, it goes over the river. So right there at the that end of the parking lot, where we're meeting. It's and that's really close to where they have a shuttle. They do have a shuttle over to Hayward Field from there, so we might have to compete with a few of their cars parking over there. But I think we, there's usually parking that runs butts right up against the bike path there, right at the at the edge of the bike bridge there. There should still be plenty of spots there for us. 
Hope to see you guys there. You gonna be recovered for that, Charlie? Yeah, I'm I'm <laughs> ready for it. <laughs> I'm playing tennis tomorrow at uh, three thirty, so we're gonna be okay. Oh yeah, uh, I don't know if Doris wants to to speak up. I can just read her note here. Uh, I think she mentioned it last week. I just wanted to share with Charlie the interesting experience I had going to Rooted in Medford. The owner asked where we heard of her place, and I told her in this group. She said, "Oh yeah, a doctor named Charlie came in and was telling her about the group. It was wonderful, and our group of mostly avid meat eaters loved the entrees, and the kids ate everything. So thanks for the referral." Have you so you've been to Rooted too, then Charlie, huh? Huh. Rooted in Medford. Oh, yeah. So my daughter lives in Medford along with my granddaughters, and we went into the owner of a new vegan restaurant. Um, and um, we, of course, got into the discussion. I told her how happy I was that they had started that restaurant. So word gets around, huh? Yeah. They remembered you there. <laughs> <laughs> Anything anyone else wants to share? And with this talk, there'll be, there'll be plenty of time for questions. I even have a added a bonus video if we have time, and I'll do that after. But yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and jump in. Good. Ready. And is my volume okay? Yeah, I can hear you okay. quite well. So I share videos, I can't use my, my um, headset, you know, my uh, AirPods, so. All right, cancer. So let's jump on in here. Couple of quotes. People do not decide their futures, they decide their habits, and their habits decide their futures. It's an unknown person said that. Like that one. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. Wendell Berry, who's a, a poet, I like that one as well. All right, let's talk about some statistics here. I updated these since I did this talk last year. I uh, got two fresh statistics from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, from 2020. Uh, cancer is getting its getting closer and closer to heart disease, but it still comes in at number two, cause of death, 602,350 deaths in the United States from cancer in 2020. Heart disease still number one at 659,000. So cancer accounts for 22% of all deaths and heart disease, 23% of all deaths. So those top two killers account for 45%. So nearly half of all the deaths in the United States come from just those top two, which is why we have a class specifically on heart disease and talk so much about heart disease and how a whole food plant-based diet is the only diet that's ever been shown to reverse heart disease. We, we say that over and over because that's the number one killer. And with cancer, we can't say it can prevent and reverse cancer, but there's, a, there's the best statistics are about 40% uh, is that 40% of cancers could be, could be reversed or prevented with diet and lifestyle. So it's about 40% because there's still about a 10 to 15% also a genetic component, but there's also some types of cancer that, um, that we don't think are quite as related to, to, to diet and lifestyle, but uh, which accounts for that only a 40%. But, uh, but we do know that all the different mechanisms that contribute to cancer, we have some effect on those. And so can only be beneficial by improving your diet and lifestyle. Uh, you know, hopefully can, can be one of those that that gets improvement from it, whether you're slowing it down or you're stopping it in its tracks or reversing it or preventing it in the first place. Uh, that's, that's why it's, it's so important to, to talk, talk about that here. So we're gonna start off just with some real basic information about cancer and how it works. And we're just gonna go through these three different uh, stages of cancer. And there's no test, so you don't have to memorize these things, but I'm just gonna just kind of give you a basic understanding. It's not like you just one day wake up and you have cancer and, and it's and you're and it's just gonna grow and you're gonna you know succumb to it. It's, it's not that simple. But so it's good to have just this basic understanding. So the first step is initiation, 
which is some sort of carcinogen comes in and alters the DNA. It's a genetic alteration or mutation of the DNA. And, and so think about all the different carcinogens we know about, you know, growing up. We've always heard about all, you know, asbestos and tobacco smoke and red dye number 42, or, you know, you think about all the different things that we've always heard about. Oh, this causes cancer. It's carcinogenic. And even, even processed meats, right? You've heard from these classes, it's carcinogenic. And so that's what we're talking about here. When something is carcinogenic and causes a alteration to the genes and mutates the DNA, then that's initiation. So it's just, that happens in our bodies all the time. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're getting carcinogens coming at us and it's altering our DNA. So think of our DNA as like, pian like piano keys and, and some of this carcinogen comes in and plays the piano keys and alters those piano keys. Think of it like that. And, but so you'd be thinking, gosh, how do we not all get cancer and die from cancer? Because there's carcinogens coming at us every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Well, we have an immune system. We have an immune system that goes and fixes all these mutations for the most part. Goes in and hey, that was that was all altered. The DNA was altered, methylated. That's not. Oh, that's not right. And then our immune system fixes it. So that's why that's so important to have a, a good immune system. And so that's the initiation stage. Next stage is called promotion, and that's where the expression of the genome happens. And that's basically taking, so now the DNA has been altered. And so say your immune system couldn't fix it. And now a normal cell that the DNA is in, inside the normal cell, that gets turned from a normal cell into a cancer cell. And so that's what promotion is, is now the, the gene or the, the cell is cancerous now. It's been turned into a cancer cell. And the other thing to think about with, with this stage is that, is that, you know, uh, so we have, we have essentially more control over this part for the most part, because, you know, we can't always avoid all the different carcinogens. We do the best that we can, but the promotion stage, once, once the cancer cell gets turned into a cancer cell, it still, we can still go backwards. We can still keep that cancer cell from growing, or hopefully our, if we have a healthy immune system, it can still deal with that and kill and help, help to kill the cancer cell basically. And it's important to, to realize that, you know, we have different kinds of genes. And so I'm just going to give you a real basic understanding. We have genes that, you know, determine our eye color or determine our hair color. And those are genes that are, we call, are basically called dictator genes. So we don't really have any choice, right? So think about that. You know, we had no choice over our hair color or eye color, things like that. So those are dictator genes. But most of the genes that we're learning is that most of the genes that determine cancer are not dictator genes. They're actually more like, instead of wor worrying about the name, think of it as like a committee. So there's a committee that decides whether a gene will stay cancerous and, 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 turn, into, and turn into cancer growth. It's like, it can, it can be turned on and it can be turned off. And uh, this is a good time to talk about real quick, the reason that we know this, it was some of the work of Dr. Dean Ornish. So you remember Dean Ornish did the the heart the reversing heart disease, the lifestyle heart trial back in 1990 that was was published. He actually did in the last 15 about 15 or so years ago now. He did uh, work with Dr. Craig Venter. Craig Venter is a geneticist who was one of the geneticists that mapped the human genome. That whole project. So he got to so Dean Ornish got to work with Craig Venter. And what they did is, the, so the same diet and lifestyle that he showed reversed heart disease, he wanted to see what it, effect it could have on early stage prostate cancer. And so he took patients randomized, in a randomized trial, took patients with early stage prostate cancer, and he put one group on, on the whole food plant-based diet with, with meditation and exercise and, um, and just a really good healthy lifestyle, what he calls, you know, uh, eat well, exercise more, stress less, love more. Those are kind of his four pillars uh, of his program. And so we put one group on that, on, on that program and the other group was just regular care. And they're, uh, so they're the control group. And what it showed with the help of Dr. Craig Venter with the gene, with the, ge the genetic aspect is it showed that there was over 300 genes that were influenced by the diet and the lifestyle. 
And what and how it influenced it was, was that the genes that promote cancer growth were turned off and the genes that suppress cancer growth were turned on. And so it, so it worked in, in two, two directions. So, so two, tumor promoter genes to promote cancer were turned off and tumor suppressor genes to attack cancer were turned on. And, and we had these, he had these genetic maps and, the, and they could tell which genes were turned on and turned off. And that's what the effect was of, of the, life, the diet and the lifestyle. And so that's a perfect example of this promotion stage because you know, these genes were, were, or that were turned on and turned off influenced whether the, the, the early stage prostate cancer cells continue to grow, grow or not. And uh, so that's really exciting information. So we, you know, we know that from basic, you know, studies where you do observational studies and, and look at what people eat and the lifestyles that they have that, that don't get cancer versus get cancer. We, we know all of this stuff, but this is exciting because it, it's actually using technology and science and we can see, well, we, now we kind of know why. And so that's, that's a really, really neat thing. And then the next stage is progression, malignancy. So actual growth of cancer. And so the, what's really important about to remember about the progression stage is this goes on for a long, long time, for years and years and years and years. Uh, certain cancers grow a little faster than others, which we're gonna talk about here in a minute with the doubling time of, of cells and cancer growth. But there's a lot of things that, that feed into this. And you've probably heard a lot about insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1. IGF-1 is a cancer promoter. So kind of think of IGF-1 as a fertilizer, it, like throwing gasoline on the fire. So animal protein contains a lot of IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. And that's like throwing gasoline on the fire. If, you, if the fire is cancer, you're throwing gasoline on it. And then there's other, other parts that, that feed into it, hormones like estrogens and uh, test too much testosterone and so too much of different hormones feeds into this um, then also another part of it is that you're you uh, um, if you do if you're doing so I talked about IGF-1 but also if, oh if you're uh, a lot of these a lot of the products and the animal products and the processed foods also have stimulate things that grow um blood vessels. So like it's called angiogenesis and, uh, promoters. And so what that means is, you know, as a tumor gets larger, it needs a bigger and bigger blood supply. And so there's certain chemicals and, and substances in processed foods and animal foods that not only promote inflammation, but also promote the growth of more blood vessels to feed the larger and larger uh, cancer, cancerous tumor. So any questions about those three stages? I didn't want to go too in depth on it, just so you have an understanding of these three stages. Any questions so far? Okay, move forward. So another a good way to look at it is the genes load the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. So that's a good good way to look at it. So we might have you know we might have gotten some bad genes from from our family genetics. Uh, and, but then the lifestyle really pulls the trigger. And then the other thing is you also learned already that we have some influence over our genes, what we, what we eat and how we live, our lifestyle, exercise, stress, all the other aspects can actually turn off the bad genes and turn on the good genes. And so we have some influence over it. It's not, not just, we're not, it's not just what we're, the cards we were dealt. We actually have some control over it. So I'm gonna show you this video. This is from Dr. McDougall. And this is from a few years back, and uh, he's going to talk just about about cancer growth and how it and how it is progresses. And this is this is from a lecture he did about Steve Jobs. So you remember Steve Jobs, who was the the CEO of Apple. So he died of pancreatic cancer, and uh, he he uh, actually was in contact with a family. Dr. McDougall was, and he got permission from the family to discuss his case here because there was some debate about they thought he he didn't get cancer surgery soon enough, and they really criticized him for not taking cancer treatment in the last like six months or something. And the reason that Dr. McDougall wanted to take this on was and to talk about it was just because he wanted to show that really the cancer had started when he was very young and, and pancreatic cancer is notoriously a very aggressive cancer. And so that the, mort the mortality rate's really, really high no matter what you do. So 
um, he was feeling like he was getting a bad, a bad break for um, just not electing to have cancer surgery and he died like six months later. Basically that it wouldn't have made much of a difference for him at the late stage. And so that's why he did this particular lecture. But the other thing I wanna mention too is uh, actually uh, Charlie and I know Dr. McDougall and, and we actually lectured with him at a continuing education conference for the osteopathic medical, uh, for Osteopathic Society of Oregon. And this is about almost four years ago now, three and a half years ago, I think it was. Uh, Charlie and I went up to lecture at Portland State University and Dr. McDougall was there lecturing with us. And I took advantage, I you know got to talk to him quite a bit and I've talked to him a few times uh, since then as well. But I asked him about, I told him I was using this, this particular clip in my classes. And he said, yeah, actually I, uh, I talked to a couple of different uh, cancer doctors about it, oncologists, and they said that uh, what he presented in, in this video was pretty, was pretty accurate. And then, uh, so I just wanted to mention that. And then one last thing is when he, when the first thing he says here, when he talks about the size of the tumor, he misspeaks. He says, uh, he says sonometer, which is supposed to mean centimeter. And when he, the first thing he shows, it says, it says millimeters and he says centimeters. So I didn't want you to get confused. So you'll see something that's the size that's like three millimeters. He says centimeter. And then later he says centimeter when it's, when it's, when he is intending it to be centimeter. So when you, so just notice that at the very beginning, he means millimeter the very first time he says centimeter. And then every other time he says centimeter, that means centimeter. And I just wanted to dis or just uh, clarify that. Okay, let's watch this. Here's the tumor that was found. I don't know what size it was. It was just reported as being found on a CAT scan. The smallest tumor you can find on a CAT scan is about two centimeters in size, which is about, about twice the size of a BB. It, it, uh, tw well, about half the size of a BB, about twice the size of a period on a paper. It's very tiny, but that would be hard to see even with a CAT scan. If you saw a tumor on a CAT scan of the pancreas, you generally expect it to be a, about a centimeter in size, which is about a half an inch. And likely it was even bigger than that. I don't know, I don't have his medical records, but I think it's fair to assume the tumor that they found on this CAT scan, on this X-ray, was at least a half an inch in size. We know that when people have cancer, this is all kinds of cancers, lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, et cetera, that people die when their individual tumors get to about 10, 10 centimeters or about four inches in diameter. So when you get to that tumor mass in the body, that's the end of life. Now, the way you get from the first cancer cell, always one cancer cell leads the way. What happens is uh, things from the environment, like environmental chemicals or the foods we eat or cigarette smoke, things from the environment attack our cells. And when they attack the cells very badly, they usually kill the cells, but sometimes they attack the cells badly enough not to kill them, but badly enough to cause them to start dividing at their own free will. And that's one of the initial steps and characteristics of cancer. Cells in general have to live in a very neighborly manner. One cell that lives to the next to the other can't divide its own free will. If it did, its cells divided at their own free will, you'd be a misshapen mass in a matter of a few hours. Instead, cells have rules, and one of those rules is you don't divide. Well, there are a couple of exceptions, like if you're a child growing, you get signals from your brain that says, okay, you can divide, you can grow into a bigger person. Or if, say, you damage yourself, say you cut your skin, then the cells next to that wound can divide. It's part of the rules, part of the survival mechanism of the body. They can divide and repair that wound. Otherwise, cells aren't allowed to divide. What happens in cancer, be it in the breast or the colon or the prostate or the pancreas, is cells get injured and they stop being neighborly and they start dividing at their own free will. And so here you have the first cell, and let's just go to job pancreatic cancer, the first cell that becomes cancerous. And it starts dividing at its free will. It turns into two cells. And there's a time interval here. It's called the doubling time, how much time it takes to go from one cell to two cells and then two cells to four, and then four to eight, 16, 32, and so on, until you develop a large tumor mass. When a tumor mass is one millimeter in size, it contains a million cells. When it's a centimeter in size, which is a half an inch, that tumor mass is one billion cells. All right, so what we know 
is that age 48, when he had that CAT scan and the subsequent needle biopsy of the pancreas, which diagnosed him as having islet cell cancer, non-endocrine cell cancer of the pancreas, he was 48 years old. And I think it's fair to assume that the tumor that they saw on that CAT scan was a centimeter in size. I'm being generous. It was could have been a little bigger than that, but it was probably one centimeter in size. He was 48 years old. And he died at age 56, and we know the tumor mass because that's how big it gets when people die. The tumor mass was now about 10 centimeters. The interval of time here between 48 and 56 is eight years. So it took eight years to double from a billion cells into a tumor mass that was big enough to kill him. Eight years. So what we need to find out is what the doubling times would, what the doubling intervals would be for a mass to grow from one centimeter to 10 centimeters. How fast would it, would it, how, how fast would it have to double to make this kind of change in eight years? And the way we figure this out is uh, by very complicated mathematics, but they can be found, these mathematics, on a website where you just enter. You enter the time the tumor starts, the time the patient died, and what it does is it tells you how fast the tumor is doubling. And based on these kinds of calculations that any of you could do, if you go to the November 2011 newsletter, it'll show you where the site is, it'll show you where the numbers are that you enter. And what you figure out is that Steve Jobs' tumor doubled about every 10 months. So to go from one centimeter to 10 centimeters during an eight year period of time, those tumors had to double every 10 months. Are you with me? All right, so we know that. His tumor was actually a very slow growing tumor. The average doubling times of tumors, say of the lung, of the breast, the colon, or the pancreas, the average doubling times are about every three to nine months. His was every 10 months, so it was slow doubling. All right, so we went from one centimeter to 10 centimeter with a doubling time of uh, 10 months. Every 10 months it doubled, took an eight year period of time. From that, we can figure out when the cancer started, when that first cell that became cancerous, when was that? All right, so you've got the doubling time from one centimeter that's where it found in the pancreas to a tumor mass of 10 centimeters, which is how big the tumors are by the time a person died. That took place in eight years, means those doublings took place in every 10 months. All right, well, let's just go backwards. Let's go from one centimeter to the first cell at a doubling rate of every 10 months. So we can calculate how far back it was that that first cell became cancerous in the pancreas. All right, so we put our calculations back into this double time calculator. And what we find is that to go from one centimeter to the first cell took 24 years. That means that Steve Jobs developed cancer of the pancreas when he was 24 years old. Okay, just, it's just simple math. And then it took him another eight years before that tumor mass they found in the pancreas finally got big enough to kill him. <coughs> That's, again, the purpose of that was to just kind of see that, hey, it, it, it progresses over a long period of time. So no matter where any of us are, we can have some, some control over it. We can stop feeding that cancer with, with all, this, all the stuff we talked about here tonight. So and feed it whole plant foods, all right? Any, any questions, comments about that? Was that helpful just to kind of see how, I think that just why I wanted to take away is just to see how long of a process that is over time uh, for tumors to grow and to cause, and to cause symptoms and cause problems and, and to ultimately kill us if it, do, if it does, if it's one that, that, that isn't, isn't curable. All right. Next, I'm going to talk to tell you guys a story, the farm story. And this is a, also a good way to, to learn about cancer. It's a little bit, it's, it's a very complicated topic, so I'm just trying to keep it as simple as possible. And so it's, we're going to talk about turtles, rabbits, and birds. And so the, we're, what the, the experiment we're doing here, the game we're doing here, is think about your, you have a farm, and your body is a farm. And the goal is to keep the animals on the farm because the farm is, our, is, our, is us. And if an animal leaves the farm, we die from cancer. So that's a, a bit of a, a serious topic, a dark, kind of a dark topic, but it's a good way to think about, about cancer. 
And so our goal with treatment or prevention or whatever we're going to do from a nutrition standpoint, from a, a treatment standpoint with our physicians, uh, you know, our cancer doctors, whatever, we were trying to keep these animals on the farm. So we have turtles, rabbits, and birds. And these are kind of different, three different types of cancer. And we're going to talk about each of these, but kind of keep in the back of your mind the whole time I'm talking about these, that every type of cancer has turtles, rabbits, and birds. So prostate cancer has turtles, rabbits, and birds. Breast cancer has turtles, rabbits, and birds. Pancreatic cancer has tur turtles, rabbits, and birds. But you don't always know which one you have. Sometimes you do because of the ag aggressive nature when they do a biopsy and they figure out what type you have. Sometimes they we have an idea of which of which one of these three animals you have, but uh, let's just talk about each of these three and then we'll come back to that. So turtles are slow, right? Slow growing turtles. And so turtles, you die from other causes. Cancer would not have ever caused symptoms or problems the majority of the time. And that's important, the majority of the time, not necessarily every time. And prostate cancer is typically is, is the most common one that has a lot of turtles because you always hear about guys, you know, I think it's something like 80% of men over age 80 have prostate cancer, 90% of men over 90 have prostate cancer, but they're so slow growing, they're so often turtles that you'll die from something else. So more men die with prostate cancer than die of prostate cancer. So that's a, that's a true statement. And so most prostate cancers are turtles, which is why you always hear about a lot of guys when they get to be a little bit older, 60, 70, the, the doctors will just kind of follow their PSA, their, their prostate specific antigen blood test, the PSA blood test, and they won't necessarily do anything because it's like, oh, it's, it's really slow growing. You know, the, any kind of treatment we would give you likely wouldn't prolong your life. And, and so let's just keep an eye on it. So, that, so that's a good example of a turtle and a cancer that has lots of turtles. But, but there are aggressive types of prostate cancer that could be rabbits or birds. So we'll just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Rabbits are fast, fast growing, right? So it's hard to keep a rabbit on the farm because it runs around everywhere, right? And so you die from the cancer. Cancer would have caused symptoms or problems without treatment the majority of the time. And so this is a good example of what the, or the, most of the types of cancer we're trying to detect when we do screening tests. So when we do colonoscopies or we do the PSA blood test, when we uh, check for uh, CA-125 tumor marker for ovarian cancer, or when we do a, a pap smear to check for HPV and, and try to prevent cervical cancer and mammograms for breast cancer. So all the different screenings we do, we're really targeting those rabbits because you don't want to pick up a turtle necessarily because, well, unless you're just going to monitor it because you don't really want to treat someone for cancer if it's a turtle for the most part because you're, the treatment might cause harm in and of itself. You know, the, some, of, some of these cancer treatments can in and of themselves cause cancer. So you want to make, so we're really trying to treat rabbits when we, uh, when we do these screening tests because screening tests aren't, aren't really cancer treatment. They're they're not, they're just early detection, right? So they're not preventing cancer. They're just, you're just trying to pick up cancer early. And kind of the goal is pick up a, if you pick up a rabbit early, then you get the, the treatment and, and you're going to hopefully cure the cancer, put, put it into remission, right? And so that's kind of the goal there with, with, with cancer treatment. But then we also have birds and birds are super fast growing and they spread really fast. So birds, you can imagine you can't keep a bird on a farm, right? And so a bird's just going to fly all over the place. So a bird means you die from the cancer. The cancer will cause symptoms and death with or without treatment the majority of the time. And so those are some of the really most aggressive cancers, like the pancreatic cancer that's a really aggressive type. No matter what cancer treatment you, you do, if the patient dies from the cancer. Another example is the uh, BRCA gene for breast cancer. I, actually, my nephew, uh, his, his wife was only 30 years old. She had the BRCA gene and, and she died from her cancer and she did everything. She did chemo, radiation, immunotherapy. She went to Mexico, got experimental treatment. She did everything, everything possible and she still uh, died from the cancer. So she was a bird. So you can kind of look in hindsight, she was a bird. Whereas, you know, there's, again, you don't necessarily know all the time which one you are. A good, good percentage of the time with, with, with the technology today in, in cancer diagnosis and treatment, we have a pretty good idea for the most part, but um, I just wanted you to kind of come away with this kind of seeing that there's these different types of cancer 
these different, you know, how aggressive it is. And, and um, that, that can, it can also lead to problems. You can imagine, you know, there's, there is some controversy when it comes to uh, cancer screenings, because it just depends on, on which guidelines you look at. If you look at uh, the Cochrane, the Nordic Cochrane out of Scandinavian countries, you look at the United States Preventative Services Task Force, kind of the, uh, the, the agencies that just look at the science and they make uh, cancer screening recommendations, they're, they're much more conservative. They're, they're much more, there's much more controversy. They oftentimes don't recommend cancers. They don't, a lot of time, or screenings. Sometimes they don't recommend, a lot of them don't recommend mammograms or recommend PSAs. A uh, um, little bit less debate about colonoscopies. So there's a lot of variance to what is recommended for screening. And a lot of that is because of these turtles, rabbits, and birds. Because if you're treating a turtle, if you pick up a turtle early and you treat it aggressively, you might cause harm. Because, because as you can see, cancer would not have ever caused symptoms or problems the majority of the time. And so that's where it becomes more debatable. But then if you look at other ones, you know, unfortunately, some of the agencies that, that are the most aggressive with cancer screening, they have a lot, unfortunately, a lot of times they have ties to where they, they actually get profit from the cancer screening. So they're making money off the mammograms, making money off the, all the, all the uh, screening modalities. And so it's a little bit more controversial, but, uh, but you know, I don't want to get too in, in depth on that because I don't want you to, you know, just because of what you hear here tonight doesn't mean you don't get your mammogram or don't get your colonoscopy or any of these types of things. It's still a conversation you have. It's between you and your medical provider. So it's not, you know, I'm not telling anyone not to get screened or not get cancer treatment. They, they, they still want to, you know, still want to follow the advice of your, of your cancer doctor, your primary care doctor, and still go through that on a one-on-one -on -one case by case basis. I just want you to have an appreciation for, Hey, you know, if, if there is this controversy about different guidelines on cancer screening and because of this turtle rabbit bird issue, hey, I should really put a lot more effort into preventing cancer and, and improving my diet and my lifestyle because that I have some power over, I have some control over that. So that's kind of what I wanted to have you take away from this, this part of the discussion. Any questions about that? Anything in the chat, Charlie? Yeah. Um, no one in the chat, but I might add at this point uh, that Scott mentioned about the controversy and that you at least, uh, it's fair for you to hear both sides of the debate so that you can have truly informed consent. And one of the things that you could choose to do is go to Gregor's site, nutritionfacts.org. And for like mammograms, you could plug, it, plug in the word mammogram, do a search and watch a few of his videos um, and see if you come out more confused or whether you have a better understanding of why there is controversy. And then uh, you could, you know, bring up questions if you wanted about it and, and you could discuss it with your doctor. And Nancy says, I do have a question. So go ahead, Nancy. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, this is very apropos uh, to some information that I just got, uh, like a general thing I got from the insurance company, that lung cancer CT screening uh, will not be given to people after the age of, I think it's 78, mm -hmm. they said. And so I'm a little, um, I, I don't know what to think of that. So uh, do you have any comment on the CT lung cancer screening and why they would stop it at a certain age? That's a great question. It, it also goes to, we usually don't screen for colon cancer with colonoscopy after age 75 either. And the reason for that is risk benefit, basically just a risk benefit analysis. And so basically, okay, well, what if at age 70, nine, you developed a lung cancer that's, that's now detectable on a CT scan that you could have caught, you know, you could have caught it at age, what, 77, but now you're 78, no more, because the statistics show that if you do catch a cancer that's just barely, barely the size enough to see on a CAT scan at age 70, nine or, or 78, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 78 was the cutoff. <laughs> no, yeah, 78, so 79 versus 78, the chances of you having your life prolonged by 
detecting it and starting treatment at age 79 is is very low. Ah, so, you're, okay. so the so the the treatment the risk of treatment would outweigh the benefit to prolonging your life. If that does that make sense? Yeah, yes, it does. Thank you. That that was very clearly uh, stated. <laughs> yeah, it's all okay. based on statistics, basically mathematics and yep. stuff. But I, yeah, I think the important thing is you know the you know a lot of the other countries that use different guidelines, like like I said, the Nordic Cochrane and the Cochrane Collaboration. So those groups are all are physicians that look at the mat, look at the statistics, and they and, and a lot of times they decide, well, th this is not likely going to, it's not the risk isn't worth the benefit, yeah. so, so to speak. Yeah. Where th those are where some of the, the the groups differ in their in their mm -hmm. like the American Cancer Society would be considered the more aggressive because there's you know they have some they have they have they have uh, cards in the game so to speak right yeah. And I, I did, uh, I got curious about it. And of course, I tried to read something about it. Um, it, uh, it listed um, uh, ver various risks, like, uh, first of all, some exposure uh, to the radiation, even though it's not huge, but a relatively large number of false positives that would not only scare people to death, but also cause a lot of uh, procedures that would be um, painful, expensive, and might not uh, actually uh, be addressing a problem that needed to be solved. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Not and, only that, but it might have lead to infection, sepsis, yes, and death. Yes, <laughs> yes, right. That risk benefit calculation is pretty interesting when you start dealing with subjects like this. Yeah. So I appreciate the answers. Thank you. Hey, welcome. We, and we deal with that in medicine all the time. You know, when I decide, when I talk to a patient about starting a medication, it's the same conversation, risk benefit. So what are the potential side effects? What are the downsides? You know, what are the positives? And so it's that way with it, whether we do a surgery or start a medication or, or do a, a, a cancer screening or a cancer treatment. It's, it's all, it's all the same conversation. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, this is another slide I wanted to talk about. This is another thing that gets missed. And I, this is a new slide I added since last year. Um, so the cancer, people need to know this. Cancer survival is based on the five-year survival data. And so, and so there's no correlation between five-year survival rates and cancer mortality. So cancer mortality means overall death from cancer. So mortality means death. And so there's no correlation between five-year survival and total cancer mortality. So that, that, that should blow your mind because think about this. It's, it, you're considered cured a survivor of cancer. If after you're diagnosed, you're still alive five years later, you're considered a cancer survivor. But then if you die six months later, you, you don't count on that statistic. And it's your overall death from cancer that really matters. That's what we really should be talking about. And the reason this gets skewed is because we do so much cancer screening, we detect so many cancers early on. And so say, for example, you have a turtle, like we talked about earlier, and you went ahead and did full treatment, you know, radiation, chemo, the whole shebang, and you were a turtle, of course, you're still going to be alive in five years because that cancer was not ever going to cause your death, any symptoms or death, especially not after five years. And so yet then you, sometimes people will, will get cancer that's caused by the cancer treatment. And then you're, and then you still die from cancer. Say six or seven years later, you are still considered a, a five-year survivor. So you're more likely going to be alive after five years the earlier you pick up the cancer. And same with the even the rabbits. Even the rabbits, which, which this is what this is what's really disturbing to me is like say you're a rabbit, and so it's good you picked it up early. It's good you did the the cancer treatment, and you're and you're alive at five years but then you still die at year six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10. And a lot of times they compare the same cancer to somebody that didn't do treatment and they're both still alive or they both still die at year seven. But the one that, that was diagnosed and then got treatment, they're considered a cancer survivor even though they still died you know, at year seven or whatever. So, it's, it's, so that, that has to do with what's called lead, lead time. I described what's called lead time bias which is the picking it up earlier, of course, you're gonna still be alive. The earlier you pick it up, the more likely you're gonna be alive at year five, even if that means you're, you're still dying from the cancer after year five. 
And so, and then that part of that is the overdiagnosis. So what I would consider overdiagnosis is, is, you know, picking up that turtle early on and then still really treating it aggressively. And, and so you're actually causing more harm. You're actually harming that patient because you're treating their cancer, even though it was never going to cause them symptoms or cause their death. And you made them a cancer patient. So it, it is a very tough conversation to have. It's a very tough topic to, to discuss, and it doesn't often get discussed with medical providers. And I don't think, you know, they did a very good job of teaching this in, in PA school or medical school. I mean, Charlie can chime in on that with medical school, but I don't think they really, because really the goal isn't to necessarily not treat your cancer. It, the, the, and, and there's nothing wrong necessarily with the cancer treatment if it's appropriate. It's just that I don't think this, that we don't get the informed consent. The informed consent is mainly having this conversation with each patient and say, hey, you know, this, this type of cancer is typically pretty slow growing. And, not, and so you probably don't really need to do all this extra treatment. And then, hey, let's, but what can we do? What, that, what can we do that's not going to cause any, any risk? There's not, it's all benefit, no risk. Well, we could do diet and lifestyle. But again, as you guys know from this, these classes, we don't get that, that education in, in medical school or PA school. Any thoughts, Charlie? Um, no, I was just um, in a little bit of a daze because my neighbor texted me that we left our garage door open and that we may have forgotten and I, we had left all our doors open because of this. I was just asking if, if you remember in medical school getting, getting, I mean, it, it, maybe when you're in medical school, I know it's been a few years, they didn't have this, this kind of statistical information, but just about the whole, uh, you know, not really going into the, the, the this five-year survival uh, data and, and whether or not you the risk and benefit of all the different cancer treatments and things. I had none of that training, and uh, Lisa Chick just uh, wrote a note that she had not that kind of training. That she learned the definition of lead time bias, but that's about it. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, I don't want to spend too much more time on. It. I just wanted to kind of. You know, it's not as simple. It's not as cut and dry as you might you might think. And so, yeah, watch like Dr. like um, Charlie said, watch the, some of Dr. Greger's videos about mammograms. Yeah, he, he also has some about this lead time bias and overdiagnosis and ca the cancer survival and some videos on on that recently. Well, as well, if you want to learn more about it. All right, let's watch. Well, let's watch a couple of Dr. Greger videos about about cancer. The most extensive report on diet and cancer in history is constantly being updated with all the new research. In their update on colorectal cancer a few years ago, they implicated various meats, including processed meat, as a convincing cause of colorectal cancer, their highest level of evidence confirmed as a carcinogen by the World Health Organization more recently, effectively meeting beyond a reasonable doubt. The main message is that the best prevention of colorectal cancer is the combination of higher physical activity with a fiber-rich and meat product-poor diet. A decrease in half a turkey sandwich worth might lower the total number of colorectal cancer cases by approximately 20%. There are several implications of this cancer guideline update, uh, but this paper in the industry publication Meat Science decided to focus on the consumer side of the story since in their eyes, every consumer is a patient and vice versa at some point in the future. But chronic disease need not be invariably a consequence of aging. Although the evidence for the relationship between colorectal cancer risk, at least in the processed meat intake, cannot be denied, they suggest further research. For example, let's compare the risk of consuming meat to other risky practices, alcohol, lack of physical activity, obesity, smoking, Compared to lung cancer and smoking, maybe meat wouldn't look so bad. But consumers probably won't even hear about the cancer prevention guidelines. Consumers today overloaded with information. It's thus probable that the dissemination of the update on colorectal cancer drowns out in the information cloud. And even if the consumers do see it, the meat industry doesn't think they'll much care. For consumers in the Western world, the role of healthfulness 
although important, is not close to taste satisfaction in shaping their final choice of meat and meat products. It's hence questionable that the revised recommendations based on the carcinogenic effects of meat consumption will yield substantial changes in consumer behavior. And doctors and nutrition professionals feed into this patronizing attitude that people don't care enough about their health to change. This classic paper from a leading nutrition journal scoffed at the idea that people would ever switch to a prudent diet, reducing their intakes of animal protein and fat, no matter how much cancer was prevented. The chances of reducing consumption of fat, protein foods, or indeed any food to a significant effect to avoid colon cancer, virtually nil. Consider heart disease. Look, we know we can prevent and treat heart disease with the same kind of diet, but the public won't do it. The diet, they say, would lose too much of its palatability. The great palatability of ham, in other words, largely outweighs other considerations. Although health and well-being are increasingly important factors in consumer decisions, uh, this 1998 Meat Science article feared that unless meat eating becomes compatible with eating that is healthy and wholesome, it will be consigned to a minor role in the diet in developed countries during the next decade. Uh, their prediction didn't quite pan out. Here's meat consumption per person over the last 30 years. Rising, rising. 1998 was when the Meat Science article was published, worrying about the next decade of meat consumption, which rose even further, but then did seem to kind of flatten out before it started falling off a cliff. Meat consumption down about 10% in recent years. Millions of Americans cutting down on meat. So don't tell me people aren't willing to change their diets, yet we continue to get diluted guidelines and dietary recommendations because authorities are asking themselves what dietary changes could be acceptable to the public rather than just telling us what the best available science says and letting us make up our own minds about the cancer risk while feeding ourselves and our family. This one and one more. After Dr. Dean Ornish conquered our number one killer, he moved on to killer number two. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Ornish and colleagues found that the progression of prostate cancer could be reversed with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, and no wonder. If you dip the blood of those eating a standard American diet onto cancer cells growing in a petri dish, cancer growth is cut down about 9%. Put people on a plant-based diet for a year though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating within the bodies of those eating plant-based had nearly eight times the stopping power when it came to cancer cell growth. Now this was for prostate cancer, leading cancer killer specific to men and women, it's breast cancer, number one, cancer killer of young women. So researchers wanted to repeat the study with women using breast cancer cells instead, but they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So they figured, well, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different types of human breast cancer. Cancer growth started out powering away at 100% and then dropped after eating a plant-based diet for 14 days. Here's the before picture, a layer of breast cancer cells is laid down in a Petri dish and then blood from women eating the standard American diet is dripped on them. And as you can see, even the blood of women eating pretty poor diets has some ability to break down cancer. Uh, but after just two weeks eating healthy, blood was drawn from those same women. So they acted as their own control. Same women, two weeks later, their blood uh, dripped on a new carpet of breast cancer cells. And this is all that's left just a few individual cancer cells remain. Their bodies cleaned up before and after. Just two weeks eating healthy. Their bloodstream became that much more hostile to cancer. Mm -hmm. Slowing down the growth of cancer cells. It's nice getting rid of them. It's even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. After eating healthy, their own bodies were able to somehow reprogram the cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation, cell death. So dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. So again, this is the before with the 
blood of your average woman can do to breast cancer cells. So you can knock off a few. You can see one dying cancer cell there in the upper left. Uh, but then after 14 days of healthy plant-based living, her blood can do this. It's like you're an entirely different person inside. The same blood now coursing through these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating a plant-based diet. What kind of blood do we want in our body? What kind of immune system? Uh, do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop? Now, this dramatic strengthening of cancer defenses is after 14 days of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. Well, if you do two things, how do you know what role the diet played? So researchers decided to put it to the test. This is measuring cancer cell clearance is what we saw before. The effect of blood taken from those who ate a plant-based diet, in this case for an average of 14 years, along with mild excess, just like out walking every day, plant-based diet and walking. That's kind of cancer cell clearance you get. Compare that to the cancer stopping power of your average sedentary American, which is basically non-existent. This middle group though, instead of 14 years on a plant-based diet, 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years of daily strenuous hour-long exercise like calisthenics, the researchers want to know if you exercise hard enough, if you exercise long enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over there? And the answer is exercise help, no question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym is no match for a plant-based diet. Uh -huh. and, uh, tunnel imaging is before, even if you're a couch potato, eating fried potatoes, your body's not totally defenseless. Your bloodstream can kill off a few cancer cells. But exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. We think it's because of animal proteins, meat, egg, white, and dairy proteins, increasing the level of IGF-1 in our bodies, insulin-like growth factor when a cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. The same as last time, go on a plant-based diet, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But then here's the kicker. What if you added back to the cancer, just the amount of IGF-1 banished from your body because you started eating healthier? It effectively erases the diet and exercise effect. It's like you never started eating healthy at all. So the reason one of the largest prospective studies on diet and cancer found the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based, maybe because they're eating less animal protein, less meat, egg, white, and dairy protein, so end up with less IGF-1, which means less cancer growth. How much less cancer? Middle-aged men and women with high protein intakes had a 75% increase in overall mortality and a fourfold increase in the risk of dying specifically from cancer, but not all proteins, specifically animal protein which makes sense given the higher IGF-1 level. The academic institution sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette, explaining that a diet rich in animal proteins during middle age makes you four times more likely to die from cancer, a mortality risk factor comparable to smoking cigarettes. What was the response to the revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist replied that it was potentially dangerous to compare the effects of smoking to the effects of meat and dairy. Why? Because the smoker might think, why bother quitting smoking? My ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me. So better not tell anyone about the whole animal protein thing. It reminds me of a famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% higher risk of lung cancer, or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, or, or tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, or multiplying your risk sixfold by eating lots of mean dairy So." They conclude, oh, let's keep some perspective here. The risk of lung cancer from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday activities. So 
breathe deep. It's like saying, hey, don't worry about getting stabbed because getting shot so much work. Uh, how about neither? Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you know, Philip Morris stopped throwing deer under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Just saying. Don't you love Dr. Craig? <laughs> he knows how to, he has a way with words. Well, um, anybody have, before I show the last video, anyone have any questions about the last two? Oh yeah, I guess I got another slide to go over here. But any questions about those videos? I'll talk about this and then yeah, the, I have another another video from him. Scott, Doug has a question. Right. <laughs> Is the IGF for uh, red meat versus chicken versus uh, seafood the same? So it's any animal protein. So I mean, all animal proteins have IGF-1, but some have more than others. I know dairy is particularly high in IGF-1. Because think about the purpose of dairy foods is to grow a calf, you know, to over a thousand pounds in like a year or whatever, right? So it's stimulating growth. So think about insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1 is a cancer, is a to grow, grow, grow. And so it's a, it's high, really high in dairy foods, but it pretty much doesn't matter what animal protein it is, it's in all animal protein. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to add a little on to that also, in that, um, yes, um, it's true that um, you can grow a bigger cow with IGF-1. You can also grow a bigger human. There's IGF-1 in, in all mammal milks, and most mammals, they wean uh, after a certain young age and they no longer keep stimulating cells to grow uh, by weaning away from those milk and dairy products that we human seems to consume. Adding this increase in IGF-1, if people really knew that this was a growth promoting um, cancer hormone potentially, uh, they might choose to eat different foods. Just a thought. Now let's talk about some cancer-fighting superfoods. So this is a good slide to take a picture of or jot down. This mnemonic G-bombs, that comes from Dr. Joel Furman from Eat to Live. He, he came up with this, and it's just based on all the science we have to date. These are all the, the superfoods for fighting cancer. So greens and garlic is the G. So your leafy greens and then other cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, especially broccoli sprouts are really high in the sulforaphane. You've heard Charlie talk about sulforaphane is a, is a super cancer fighter. Uh, but gar garlic also has, I believe, lots of sulf sulforaphane. So greens, think of G as greens and garlic. And uh, so cru other cruciferous vegetables, Brussels sprouts, kale, um, uh, yeah. I can't think of a few other ones, but uh, yeah, all the, you know, the kind of has the, the cruciferous, you know, has the, the, the swirl. So like, I would just think of cauliflower, broccoli, br Brussels sprouts, kale, those are all cruciferous vegetables. And cabbage. Then, cabbage, yeah, good one, thank you. Ca uh, and then beans, the, the first B is beans, so all the different kinds of beans and legumes. Onions, and then the M is mushrooms. And mushrooms are interesting. The one little tidbit I know about mushrooms is uh, they have a, a substance in them called um, aromatase inhibitors. And actually, a, there's actually a cancer drug on the market that's that's thousands and thousands of dollars. That's a, that's a considered an aromatase inhibitor, and they got the idea from that from mushrooms because mushrooms contain naturally occurring aromatase inhibitors. Uh, not to mention all the all these G bombs have lots of antioxidants to fight those free radicals and they're anti-inflammatory, all the different things. And then B for berries, and then S for seeds. So greens and garlic, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds. So just as many of those, those are all in the Dr. Greger's daily dozen anyway, for the most part. So uh, just another reason to eat lots and lots of those to prevent cancer or to fight cancer if if you happen to, to have it, have cancer. Any questions about the G-bombs? Go ahead. Do you, do you know if uh, dried mushrooms are as uh, effective as fresh? Um, 
guess that I don't know. I would think it'd be okay. Um, I know you're, you are supposed to um, just mildly cook mushrooms. Raw mushrooms have a chemical that's a little bit toxic. So even just like 30 seconds in a microwave or just a little bit of a light saute deactivates the, the chemical that's a little bit harmful in mushrooms. So uh, it's good to eat them a little bit cooked. But as far as dried versus fresh, I don't think there would be a difference. I don't think there is a difference either. Thank you. Let's see, oh, okay, here it is. This is the other last Gregor video I wanted to show. This is a newer one here. Let's see if I can, I can move this down. Get this to open up here. <laughs> In 1982, a landmark report on diet, nutrition, and cancer was released by the National Academy of Sciences, the first major institutional science-based report on the topic. The report started out saying that, yes, scientists must be careful in their choice of words whenever they're not totally confident about their conclusions. But, you know, for example, by that time, it had become absolutely clear that cigarettes were killing people. But had the population been persuaded to stop smoking when the association between lung cancer was first reported, these cancer deaths would not now have been occurring. And you know, if you wait for absolute certainty, millions of people could die in the meanwhile. That's why sometimes you have to invoke the precautionary principle. Uh, for example, emphasizing fruits and vegetables may reduce the risk of several common forms of cancer. We're not completely sure but there's good evidence. And what's the downside of eating more fruits and vegetables? So why not give it a try? The 1982 National Academy of Sciences report continued, the public is now asking about the causes of cancer that are not associated with smoking. What are these causes? And how can these cancers be avoided? Unfortunately, it's not yet possible to make firm scientific pronouncements about the association between diet and cancer. We're in that interim stage of knowledge similar to that for you know cigarettes 20 years ago. Therefore, in the judgment of the committee is now the time to offer some interim guidelines on diet and cancer. For example, they raised concern about processed meats. And 30 years later, it was confirmed. Processed meat was officially declared carcinogenic in humans. Maybe if we had listened back then, maybe we would have been spared Lunchables, which if taken apart, a CEO of Philip Morris describes reading, the most healthy item in it is the napkin. The findings of this diet and cancer report generated a striking level of disbelief from the cancer community and outright hostility from people and the industries whose livelihood depended on the foods being questioned to the point of accusing one of the authors of the report of killing people with formally organized petitions to expel the researchers from their professional societies. Uh, clearly, a very sensitive nerve was touched. The American Meat Science Association and other members of the Council for Agricultural Sciences and Technology criticized the report. Yeah, maybe it would save lives, but the recommended reductions in meat consumption would sharply reduce incomes to the livestock and meat processing industries. The fruit and vegetable industries would clearly benefit if consumers were to implement the guidelines. However, fruit and vegetables account for less than 15% of cash receipts. Most of the money is in cattle, hogs, poultry products, feed grains, and oil crops. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It reminds me of the tobacco industry memos where Philip Moore spoke of the tobacco industry going bankrupt. Maybe it's not the meat that's causing cancer, the industry critique continued, but all the marijuana people are smoking these days. How can one argue that such an abundant diet causes cancer? Maybe they're just all jealous of all the good food we're eating, like the Puritans that condemned bear baiting, not because of the pain for the bear, but because of the pleasure of the spectators. He can't tell us to cut down on meat. One of mankind's few remaining pleasures is that of the table. The day the National Academy of Sciences report was published was the day that food was declared a poison, declared Thomas Jukes, uh, the guy who discovered you could speed up the growth of chickens by feeding them antibiotics. 
How dare the National Academy of Sciences recommend people eat fruits, vegetables, and whole grain daily, which were said to contain as yet unidentified compounds that may protect us against certain cancers. How can one select foods that contain unidentified compounds? This is not a scientific recommendation. It sounds like health food store literature. My favorite though was think about the human breast. How can animal fat be bad for us if breastfeeding women create so much of it? Uh, women are animals. Their mammary glands make fat for breast milk. Therefore, we shouldn't have to cut down on burgers? Huh? So anyway, what does the latest science tell us about nutrition and cancer? What are the other five recommendations? We talked about eating more fruits and vegetables. Consumption of soy products may not only reduce the risk of getting breast cancer, but also surviving it. And then in terms of dietary guidance suggestions on foods to cut down on where evidence is sufficiently compelling, include limiting or avoiding dairy products uh, to reduce the risk of prostate cancer, limiting or avoiding alcohol to reduce the risk of cancers of the mouth, throat, esophagus, colon, rectum, and breast, avoiding red and processed meat to reduce the risk of cancers of the colon and rectum, and avoiding grilled, fried, and broiled meats to reduce the risk of cancers of the colon, rectum, breast, prostate, kidney, and pancreas. And, and in this context, they're talking about all meat, including poultry and fish. Uh, look, we all have to make dietary decisions every day. We can't wait for the evolution of scientific consensus. I and mean, until we know more to protect ourselves and our families, all we can do is act on the best available evidence we have right now. <clears throat> Pick that up. Does anyone have questions about? Uh, we've talked about soy reducing cancer. Is anyone out there new enough that they don't they didn't haven't heard us talk about that that the estrogens in soy are not are not uh, cancer causing, they actually reduce cancer. Is that news to anyone, anyone here? That, that, uh, that science came out probably eight or nine years ago now. Actually, I just had a patient the other day who, who told me that, oh, their cancer doctor said they have estrogen positive breast cancer, they should not eat soy. And it's like, oh my gosh, it's like, that means that, that doctor hasn't looked at the science for the last eight years and it's like, it's not good because because we learned that there are are two different receptors for estrogen, and it, there's alpha receptors and beta receptors. And so the estrogen that's in soy is called phytoestrogen, so that's plant estrogen, phytoestrogen, and it hits mostly the beta receptor. And the beta receptor actually blocks estrogen's effects in the breast, which is a good thing if you have breast cancer or you're trying to prevent breast cancer but it promotes estrogen in the areas of the body that benefit from estrogen, like the blood vessels and you know, keeping you, your body healthy and things like that. So, so, it, so it blocks the bad estrogen in the bad places where you don't want it and it promotes estrogen in the places you do want it. So that's, that's why when we look at observational studies, we were trying to figure out well, why is it that these Asian, before maybe 20, 30 years ago, why are the, are the women in the Asian countries that eat the most soy of anybody have the low, some of the lowest rates of breast cancer? It didn't really kind of, didn't really jive, didn't really make sense. And so then now, eight, years, eight or so years ago, we figured out, oh, it's because there's these two different receptors and phytoestrogen doesn't have the same effect as, as the, like getting extra estrogens from say, uh, uh, dairy products, for example. Because think about it, it's a pregnant cow, a pre cow that's pregnant all the time. They have tons of estrogen, and that's the kind of estrogen that does stimulate breast cancer. So what a cancer doctor should be saying is don't eat meat and dairy products, especially dairy products, if you want to, you know, avoid estrogens. And a lot of women that take, that have breast cancer, estrogen positive breast cancer, take tamoxifen, which is a estrogen blocker. And that's the whole reason. So, you know, they should just be avoid, being told they should avoid especially dairy products, but also animal products and, and should eat soy because it, it has a positive effect on breast cancer. So, so yeah, it's a, uh, just wanted to mention that in case any of you hadn't heard of that because that's still a myth out there that, that still perpetuates. 
Other questions, comments, concerns, anything that we got? Uh, Abby and Doug have a raised hand. Uh, oh, what's your feeling about drinking soy milk? I drink uh, three cups a day. Yeah, that's that probably, probably plenty. So Dr. Greger recommends three to five servings of soy a day. And so the, so the healthiest soy would be the edamame, which is the whole soybean. Next, next healthiest would be tempeh, which is fermented soy. And there's just the pieces of the edamame soybean inside the edamame patty. That would be the next healthiest. And then miso, like miso soup, that's fermented soy. Tofu is just minimally processed soy. Then soy milk, you know, soy milk would be okay. Um, you just, I wouldn't probably drink more than three cups. I'd probably keep it a little bit lower. I mean, we just usually recommend putting it on your oatmeal or something like that, not just, you know, guzzling it down just because that's a little bit more processed, least healthy of one of the more unhealthy, I wouldn't say unhealthy, but least of the healthy versions of, of soy, of getting soy. But yeah, I would say an unsweetened soy milk on your on your uh, oatmeal or whatever is would be would be totally fine. Well, I drink that because it's an easy way to get a lot of protein. The other uh, other uh, non-dairy milks don't have much protein. I just wonder if there's any objection to doing that. Yeah, and if you're doing it just to get more calories in, if you're someone that's trying to gain a little bit of weight, maintain your weight, that, that would be a good good way to get X, some extra calories because you're you know usually we say don't drink your calories if you're trying to lose weight. But if you're trying to maintain or gain weight, then you kind of do want to drink some calories just because it's a good way to get it in. So, yeah. So I'd like to make a little comment about the protein because we hear this all the time. And that is the deficiency in our diet is not protein. You get plenty of protein if you're eating a variety and you're eating enough foods. Um, uh, if the focus, hopefully, after going through attending these classes is going to tend more toward fiber as being the deficiency. Remember, spinach has 50 or 40% protein. Um, all plants, every plant, legumes, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, all have protein in them. And uh, if you're just eating soy for that reason, you might find more fiber in another food and not worry so much about the protein. Just my thought. It's not going to be harmful for you to be doing two or three cups of soy if you're otherwise plant-based and eating a variety of foods. But for me, I'd like to eat some more variety. I, uh, I'm having an endoscopy next week. As boss, I have presumptive uh, for uh, celiac disease. And yep. so I'm kind of malnourished, lo losing weight even though I'm eating 2,500 calories a day. So that's why I was drinking a lot of soy. You tried to give up, glute, go gluten-free then if, to see how you feel? Right. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. So, Trouty. Yes. Uh, I see your name up there, like you unmuted yourself. No, I didn't unmute, uh, un, uh, well, just a picture. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Usually when it gets unmuted, that's when it comes up. So I have a question, uh, which I'd like to do as sort of a review of what Scott went over with this lecture today. Uh, what foods are, are cancer promoting? Does anyone care to share? Dairy. Uh, Dairy and processed meats. Yeah. yeah. Dairy and animal animal protein. Animal oh. food. Yeah. Animal protein. Very good. Anything else? Sugar. Sugar. <laughs> um, so I guess sugar may lead to some increased inflammation, which could do that. There is something else that might be a beverage to some. Alcohol? Yeah, alcohol. <laughs> you know, alcohol mm -hmm. is, uh, how much alcohol can you drink and not affect breast cancer? Zero. Mm -hmm. The answer is uh, most any amount of alcohol 
leads to an increase in breast cancer. You might choose red wine, uh, which has sort of uh, in some, I don't know, some of the science shows it may have a neutral effect, but most all alcohol has uh, negative effects or increases. And then there are certain ways foods are prepared. Does anyone want to share that? What? Yes. Um, anything that's cooked at high temperature over charcoal, for example. Scott, I think they're getting it. Yeah, very good. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Dication and products and AGEs and dioxins and all that stuff, you know, carcinogens from cooking food at high temperature, just like you said. Yep. Okay, now I have another question. How important is fiber in colon cancer and why? It's very important because it cleans out the cancer. Uh, so, could we define that a little bit more as to, oh, uh, uh, you're right. It's very important. And specifically, um, what might, why is it that if you add 10 grams of fiber to your diet, you have a 10% reduction in your risk of colon cancer? It's another way to say it. What does that fiber do in your colon? Cleans it out. <laughs> so, if you have a cancer and you rub fiber on it, it may not actually sweep it away. No, it kills but what, it. It may reduce some of the things that cause cancer. What might they be? Uh, toxins, poisons like mercury and dioxin and uh, what have you. The yeah. fiber speeds those toxins out of your colon, doesn't allow them to stay in contact with the colon wall. So you have less promotion of and, and creation of cancer. Does that make sense? Out, and it also shuttles out excess estrogen and testosterone, excess hormone. Another good reason. Okay. Can Next you, question. Can you repeat what it what it speeds out? What what? It speeds out the toxins that cause the cancer as they if they lay in your intestine, uh, like mercury or dioxin or some of the other toxins. <laughs> mercury and what else? Dioxins. Mercury, dioxin. Um, heterocyclic amines. I can't, uh, I can't spell that. <laughs> That's okay. Can I ask, can I ask about oil? That yes. Important. <laughs> uh, the, all the, the recommendations are to stay away from all kinds of oil, canola, vegetable, olive oil, any of the oils. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Go Is ahead, that, Scott. Yeah, just all highly processed. So it's just it's basically the fat equivalent of white sugar. So, you know, you take a plant that was nothing wrong with sugar cane or a sugar beet, nothing wrong with it. But you refine it down to a crystalline powder, you have something that causes inflammation. You do the same thing with an olive, with a nut, with a seed, an avocado, and you turn it into nothing but a processed liquid oil, which is just 100% fat. What can, what can you it. use instead of oil then for things like, you know, greasing a pan or uh, greasing a grill or, you know, many, many recipes say just brush, brush the fish with, with some light olive oil. What can you use instead of that in all case and for all things? Yes, yeah, so you can do water sauteing. So on my, on my meal building basics handout on the back side, it shows a description of how you water saute. You can use water, you could use vegetable broth, vegetable stock, even some wine because it evaporates. So there's a whole process of, of dry saute, water saute you can use instead of oil. And then all the different whole food plant-based cookbooks have uh, other things you can use instead of oil in your cooking. So like applesauce or, um, or what, what uh, the, the liquid that comes from like garbanzo beans. I'm drawing a blank on the any of those, any of those liquids instead okay. of oil. Yeah, correct. Okay. correct. Thank you. 
I'd like to go back to G bombs. And uh, who would like to volunteer? Um, how much greens should one potentially consider eating for a day? At and what quantity? A pound. a pound? At least two pounds, a pound raw and a pound cooked. That's a lot of, of that. That's something that I might do. I, <laughs> and yeah, I, I would say at least two handfuls of, um, of greens and one handful of cruciferous or a, you know, like a serving would be a half a cup to a cup, depending on whether it's cooked or raw. So think about eating more greens, particularly cruciferous, if you're interested in, in um, not having cancer or not promoting it. How about garlic? How much garlic might you consider consuming in a day? I take the pills. I can't take it. <laughs> okay, well, uh, taking garlic powder and the pills uh, might be one form. Um, I'm not sure how they're prepared. Uh, I guess that would be something you could discuss with the company that makes the pills, uh, whether they're uh, destroying uh, some of the, um, I think it's alanin to mm -hmm. allicin yeah, or yeah. something like that. Al Alan. Yeah. So uh, I choose to eat one clove of garlic a day. I chop it up and eat it raw. If you're not gonna eat it raw and you wanna cook it, you wanna let it rest for 15 minutes. Um, Nancy? Oh, um, uh, this is an interesting discussion. Well, I eat a lot more garlic than that. <clears throat> I have, <clears throat> and because I love it so much, I have a huge crop. So, uh, you know, um, <laughs> But, but I, I think it's okay. <laughs> okay. A, so you, you can, some people can eat more, but if you eat too much, we had one person uh, who ate so much that he had stinging and burning in his bladder. <laughs> really? So, okay. Yeah. So you might take that in consideration. There is an upper limit. <laughs> I'm not sure what that is for an individual. I have never reached it, but now that I know the symptom, I will keep an eye out. <laughs> okay. How much garlic might you eat in a day? Um, on some days, I might eat uh, the, an entire bulb. Okay. Some of it cooked, some of it in salad dressing. Um, uh, maybe, um, you know, roasted with vegetables or something. Okay, so now the class has heard what the kind of uh, maximum amount that people can tolerate. So if you <laughs> at least get one clove in for the day, that would be a good start. And if you choose to eat more, that would be fine also. And you had another question? I did have another question because um, we were talking about how many uh, green vegetables to eat in a day. And um, do you have any comment about uh, whether it's important with like the broccoli and Brussels sprouts and kale and so forth uh, to, to cook them instead of eating them raw because of the effect on thyroid? Or do you think the thyroid problem is overestimated? In I my, I think it's overestimated unless you're eating multiple, multiple handfuls of, of um, cruciferous uh, foods. Okay. Scott, what's your take on that? Yeah, it can be a real excessive amount. So that's why we always recommend a wide variety. And then, then also the importance of getting enough iodine, because if you're getting enough iodine, then it won't be such a big deal if you eat little extra cruciferous vegetables. But if you eat just a ton and ton and ton of cruciferous vegetables and you get iodide deficient, then you could suppress your thyroid. So okay, but cooking uh, uh, erases that. Uh, if you, yeah, right, if you cook it, it's okay. It reduces the risk. Okay, okay, thank you. How much mushroom would be a good amount a day? Anybody? 
two mushrooms. Okay, uh, that's a good start. I eat how one big? mushroom a day. How big, how big are the mushrooms? Yeah, that's really important. How big are they? Dr. Gregor recommends a quarter cup as a serving of mushrooms. That's a small serving and one or two mushrooms, depending on their size, could fit in that quarter cup. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's you don't not have to eat a whole bunch. You don't have to <laughs> stuff yourself. What variety do you eat? I just eat, he recommends the white button or the, um, what are the other kind? Criminy. I was wondering about shiitake. Any kind are good, oh. but he says the cheapest ones work just as well. Okay. Shiitake, I think, is more expensive. Yeah. But it's okay. If you yeah. like them, eat them. Well, I, I've heard they have extra um, benefits. Uh, okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, berries. How much berries in a day? Blueberries, strawberries, cherries. One half cup. cup. Is one half, cup. Half a half cup a is cup. a serving. Oh, yeah. So if you want to eat a cup, that's great. Uh, but at least a half a cup is what's considered a serving. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. And how about seeds? Anybody have any comment about what's the one important seed that everybody should get in their life? It's quite a cup. Of what kind and of seed? Walnuts. Um, I don't know that everybody has to eat at walnuts. Uh, a quarter cup is the probably the ideal amount of nuts overall. And is it black seed? Flaxseed. flaxseed is what the what we're looking for. Is it and, one ounce? Is it it's one a ounce? tablespoon. Tablespoon. A tablespoon of ground flaxseed, and some people may want to take two tablespoons uh, if they want to better control their diabetes. But a, a tablespoon of ground flaxseed, which is called flax meal when it's ground, so you can buy it either way. Scott brought up a number of very important points in this lecture. And uh, anybody else have questions? I ask about chia seeds. A lot of the plant-based things that I see recommend chia seeds. That's high on the list for recommended intake. Why is that? It's also just really high in, in omega-3 fatty acids. So it's a really good one to use in cooking. I know Eric, uh, Dr. Colgrove, who he wasn't here tonight, but he He's really into it. He makes chia pudding and different things all the time. It kind of gels up to gels up in things. So it's omega threes. You're yeah. saying okay, That's just just as good as flax meal. It's just still recommend the flax meal because it just has a lot of good studies on it for for an anti as a um, anti inflammatory, reduced blood sugar, um, and also good in the omega threes. So so he always has that on the daily dozen. But yeah, chia seeds could count towards your your. Uh, a tablespoon or two of, of seeds every day to fight cancer and just good good health. Thank you. What does it taste like? <laughs> they taste like nothing. They're tiny little black seeds and they taste like nothing. Put them in your cereal and you not even notice they're there. It kind of gives a texture is what I noticed. The things that I put it in, it gives a little bit of texture you know, a little bit of seedy, gritty texture. So I, eat, I eat a tablespoon a day and, and it's, you know, like my wife said, it's texture. You really don't notice the flavor. the flavor of it. No flavor? No, I don't notice anything. It's... And if your goal is to increase the omega-3s in your life, uh, flax seeds is one, quarter cup of walnuts a day is two, and uh, sea vegetables like uh, dulse or wakame, uh, nori are three. Isn't that salty? Uh, sea vegetable, it tastes salty, but it's, um, it's the amounts that you're eating are not gonna contribute that much salt. It will contribute okay. some iodine. Um, 
hopefully in the amounts that you need. Any other questions for anybody? Mm -hmm. so, okay. Can cancer talk next week? This has been fantastic tonight. I really, yeah. really appreciate, you know, all of the information that you've given it. I've taken three pages of notes. So thank you so much. I, I did too. Yeah. It's, it's, been very it's very informative. And the way you described the cancer thing, Scott, was very helpful to look at, you know, the different farm animals, the turtle, the rabbit, and the bird, and, and that you, know, you really presented it in a way that was easy to listen to and to understand. So thank you so much. You're welcome. And I hope, you know, people aren't walking away, you know, being concerned about whether they should get their cancer screenings or, you know, get cancer treatment that's recommended. It's, that wasn't the objective, but it was just to kind of say, hey, you know, it's not quite as cut and dry as, as one might think. And we need to have a really good informed consent conversation with our medical providers. And, and then, hey, we got, we got some power over our lifestyle, what we choose to, to eat and how we move and, and the stress and all the lifestyle things can, can play a positive role in, in that. So it's, a, it's an adjunctive treatment. And I'm really encouraged because I've had patients that went to, to the cancer doctors, the oncology clinics, even like Lamont uh, Valley Cancer Institute here in town. And I've had a lot of patients that talk to the dietitian there and they, they are very encouraging to follow a plant-based diet. So they're, they're very, the dietitians there are very uh, knowledgeable about that. So. I live in Southern California and I have two friends who had cancer diagnosis. And the first thing that within two weeks of their diagnosis, the dietitians that they were sent to told them to be on a plant-based diet and really encourage the plant-based diet. And it, you know, it really helped slow things down from what the doctors had initially told the people that what their life expectancy was. They changed to the plant-based diet and it slowed the progress. It, at least, you know, I mean, how do you know for sure? But it appeared that it did. And, it, and they felt so much better too, physically. They felt healthier, you know, so. I think that, you know, what you presented tonight is to me just total, you know, confirmation, affirmation that plant-based is what you have to do. And I'm thinking I need to call my daughter and tell her, get my grandson off of plants. I mean, off of animal products, you know, yeah. get him on plant-based. He's young. Get him healthy now. <laughs> so, Great. Thanks for, thanks yeah. for that. <laughs> we'll second that, but step uh, softly on that issue, uh, because uh, from my personal experience, uh, telling family members to uh, do something uh, against the uh, tradition uh, can you can get some real blowback from that. And uh, I've had some really angry family members over the years. They were gradually coming around, but uh, it's taken many, many years. So set the example and hopefully they follow good advice <laughs> <laughs> scott great job yeah thank you uh next next week we're going to continue on uh we'll share a, a bit more on on cancer and uh, uh any further questions if not get some sleep charlie <laughs> yeah i'm gonna go get some sleep i'm gonna thank you charles thank you scott you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. It's been fun. Right. You see some of you guys at the walk on Saturday. News yeah, news. remember the walk. Yeah, and check out the go to Eugene Plant Based Providers website under upcoming events. All the details are there. You missed it at the beginning. I talked about it at the beginning of class, but yeah, 11 o'clock on Saturday, Valley River parking lot right by the bike bridge, 11 o'clock Saturday. All right. Just wanted to say hi to you guys. Haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> hey, it's good to see your face and have you back, Lisa. Good to see you guys too. Thanks for the talk. Wish we lived locally. Thank you. I'm so appreciative that you're on Zoom so that we can you know, <laughs> tap in every week. We're down in LA County. And so it's wonderful to be able to have this access because I have not found a group locally that is as informative as this. So it's very beneficial. Where in right. LA County are you guys? We're in Arcadia. Oh, okay. Yeah. My family's in, um, in 
Glendale, La Crescenta area. Yeah, yeah. Couple yeah. about four, five miles away. So you're in the district. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm an inventor now, so oh, okay. <laughs> that's a nice place to be. <laughs> it is nice. Yes, it is. Went to the beach today. <laughs> oh, lucky you. Lucky you. It's hot inland. It's probably thirty <laughs> degrees cooler. Where it is actually. I checked. Sixties, <laughs> seventies here. <laughs> So thank you. Appreciate you. Okay. Have a, have good, night. A good, night. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Take care. Good night. Good night. <laughs>